Good evening, PubConf. My name's Dylan Beatty, and tonight I'm going to tell you a horror story. It's not a horror story about zombies or vampires or flesh-eating bugs. No, it's a horror story about smartphones, and it starts like this. You're on your way to work. You're on the tube. It's crowded. You somehow manage to get a seat. And just as you're settling in for your morning game of Clash of Clans, somebody grabs your phone from your hand, jumps through the closing doors, and legs it. We have a name for this. We call this Game Over, because somebody has your unlocked smartphone. That means by the time you get off the train, get up to street level, find a payphone, <laughs> wait, that won't help, you don't know any numbers. They've had your social media, your email, your banking, everything for five or ten minutes. Now imagine it's the not too distant future and the phone you're using has got face recognition built in. You can set your phone up so that it will only work when you're looking at it. The second our anonymous perpetrator grabs your phone out of your hand, it locks. It locks because it can't see you anymore, and it only works when you're making eye contact. When you get it back, you don't have to touch it or enter a passcode. All you do is look at it and smile, and your phone unlocks. Does this sound far-fetched? Well, ten years ago it would have sounded impossible, but there's probably people in the audience here tonight thinking, yeah, we could probably make that work. And I'll bet good money, in fact, I'll bet all of you a pint that at PubConf 2018, there's phones in the room that can do this. Face recognition has long been one of the holy grails of computer science. Human beings can recognize faces from the age of about six months. It's taken computer science nearly six decades to catch up with what Success Kid here can do without even thinking about it. The basic proposition is pretty simple. Take a photograph. Are there people in this photograph? How many people? Do we know who these people are? Are these people that we've seen before? And one of the reasons that human beings are so incredibly good at doing this is that there is a subroutine running on our little overclocked monkey brains flat out all the time going, is that a face? Is that a face? Is that a face? And this is why human beings see faces absolutely everywhere, even places where there aren't any faces. This routine is so heavily optimized that you can actually hack it. If you show a human being something that looks like a face, but there's something wrong with it, something wrong with it in an unnatural way. The effect can be really profoundly unsettling. You can do great things with special effects and makeup to exploit this. And speaking of unsettling, here's Todd. Hey Todd, isn't Todd a happy guy? Except wait, there's something not quite right about Todd, because we've turned Todd's eyes and mouth upside down, and your brain's auto-corrected them. That's what Todd's supposed to look like. But enough about monkey brains, let's talk about computering. Because face recognition within the last decade has hit the point where it's a real technology with real applications that's starting to raise some real questions about the world we live in. Anybody who's landed in the United Kingdom traveling with a biometric passport in the last few years will have stood very still while you look very patiently at that little webcam that takes a picture, compares it to the data on your chip, and works out whether you're allowed in. And of course, there's always a queue. But what if it worked differently? Imagine this. As you're getting off the plane, the cameras are watching you. As you walk through the concourse, the cameras are watching you. As you queue for your bags, the cameras are watching you. The cameras are all wired into the face recognition grid. By the time you get to passport control, they already know who you are. You don't even need to show a passport. Privacy implications for this kind of technology can be frightening. It's widely assumed in data protection that if you're collecting data on people, it's fine as long as you do it anonymously. But if a surveillance network knows everywhere you've been for the last six months, does it really matter if they don't know your name? Facebook have a face recognition algorithm they call DeepFace, which has an accuracy somewhere in the high 90s. This means that if anyone anywhere has taken a photograph of you at that Justin Bieber concert you went to and uploaded it to Facebook, Facebook knows you were there. They don't talk about it, but they know. There are amazing social implications for this kind of technology as well. From missing children to wanted fugitives, if the authorities are looking for you, it doesn't matter why they're looking for you, they just need to wait for you to look at a camera, and suddenly, bang, they know exactly where you are. And then there are the creative applications of face recognition. This is from a site called twinsornot.net, powered by Microsoft's Project Oxford Technology, which tells us, among other things, that the casting was one of many things that were wrong with the Star Wars prequels, that when they cast Helen Mirren as Elizabeth II in the film The Queen, they did a pretty good job in finding a likeness, but not nearly as good as the likeness they got when they cast Morgan Freeman as Nelson Mandela in the film Invictus, where they smacked it out of the park. 
But there are some problems that even the most advanced face recognition technology can't help us with, like answering the question of exactly how much Scott Hanselman looks like Chris O'Dowd from TV's The It Crowd. PubConf, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much, and good night.